announcements. All right, so we just got our first exam back. I just want to give you a sense of the distribution of grades in this class. So the high grade in this room was a 94 out of 100. The median, what does the word median mean? Middle, it, it is an average, but there are a lot of different ways to think average. So what do we mean when we say middle or average in this case? What do we have to do first to all the grades in order to think about the median? Is it add them all up? Median. We put them in order. So we're going to put everybody up in a row. Now, of course, we won't do this to you, but we would stand everybody up here in a row in the order in which we got the grades from high to low or low to high. And then the middle person is what we're calling the median. So the middle person in this room got a 79.5, although technically there's no 0.5, so actually there was no single middle person. There were two people that were kind of in the middle. And, um, and the average there was 79.5, which means that half of you uh, scored better than 79.5 and half of you scored lower than 79.5. I'm not making any kind of judgments and you each have your own like internal scale for like what's a good grade, but I just wanna give you a sense of, of how people did on this particular test that you just took. Okay, so a couple of other announcements about the exam. First of all, as usual, there's an answer key in the math studio over by where you read the letters. And um, the, there's also an answer key in reserve on the library and you will find an answer key for every quiz and test in those two places shortly after you get your test back. So you can always check your answers. Is my answer key also floating around here? Is that back there? Good, so it'll, it'll keep making its way around. You can look there. Okay, um, an observation about the test. A lot of people are still having issues with fractions. Now this class assumes fractions as a prerequisite. And so I, I know some of you must be, you must be tired of losing points on tests because of fractions. It's not the algebra that got some people, it's the fractions that got some people. So um, for example, I'll write down over here on the whiteboard. Uh, I think one of the problems was something like, you've got it in front of you, this one. I'll do it on the whiteboard. Um, so one of the problems was this 7 fifths equals W over 3. What number was this? Five. Number 5. You guys remember this one? Okay. So most people got it right in terms of the first step saying, okay, I have to solve for W. Somebody took W and divided by 3. So what's the opposite? Is multiply by 3. So most people did that right. Times 3 on both sides and this guy cancels and we get W equals whatever is left on, on the left hand side. But here's a really common mistake that a lot of people made. They saw this three times seven fifths and they times the top by three and they times the bottom by three and they got 21 over 15 equals W. And that is not right, but a lot of people don't know how to multiply fractions. And so you're losing points, not because of an 095 skill, an algebra skill, it's an arithmetic thing that you're missing from, the, from your past. Um, if you multiply the top and bottom by three, effectively you haven't done anything to the number, right? Because multiplying top and bottom by three cancels. And if you reduce 21 fifteenths, some of you ended up, lo and behold, right back with the seven fifths that we started with. That's not right. Um, so let me put a line through this and say that three is really a three over what number? It's really a one down there. And so the three is really only up on top. And so the answer to this one is actually W equals 21 over five. I, uh, I prefer leaving this as an improper fraction as opposed to a mixed number, what, four and a fifth. I think it's better to leave it as an improper fraction, just in general. And then um, even for the folks that got 21 fifths, the right answer down here, still checking the answer was difficult for many people because you had to take that 21 fifths and divide it by three, right? Take the W and stick it back into the original equation. So many people when faced with 21 fifths divided by three didn't know how to handle it and hope or hope to get around to the seven fifths, which is what we should. So again, it's a, it's a fraction issue. It's not an algebra issue. Um, so I'll just do it real quick here. Uh, I will say that uh, my way of thinking of this involves changing the division fraction line into a division symbol. And then now that it looks like this, maybe this will start to ring a bell. You change division to multiplication and you change the three to one third. We flip it over, right? You guys remember how to divide fractions? So keep the first, change division to multiplication, flip over the second. 
And then we go straight across 21 fifteenths, which reduces to the 7 fifths that we want. Okay, so all this is to say that if you are losing points on fractions and you are tired of losing points on fractions, it's time to jump in and be active about it. Do something about it. There are practice problems in your book. Here are the page numbers. You will find the practice problems for fractions. It's 745 to 6 and 750 to 752. And if you want more problems or you have questions about any of that, see me after class. We will get you to where you need to be in terms of understanding how to work with fractions. Holly. The key? Yeah. Yes. Oh, the circled numbers, the circled numbers on my answer key are how many points I awarded for the partial steps okay. along the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, good question. Okay, so uh, one other announcement about the test. If you are feeling that this class is too fast, I just want to remind you, even though we're past the add drop, uh, add drop date, uh, it is not too late to consider switching to math 094. So I'm going to stare at the back wall so nobody thinks I'm talking to them specifically right here. But Math 094, remember, is this class that's, that's um, in between the Math 090 and this Math 095. It's at a slower pace and is designed to get people ready for this class right here. So if you are feeling like you aren't ready for this class right here, see me and I can talk to you about details about making this switch this semester. There's no charge in terms of financial aid. It's just a swap from this class to a different class. So see me after class if there are questions on that. It's really weird to just stare at the brick while I'm talking to you guys. Okay. Um, so I think that's that. Last thing about the test, on the yellow piece of paper on the back, this was the calculator section, uh, I give you a current snapshot of your grade. So the top number is, what is the top number? Top number is your homework average out of 100. Second number is your quiz average. We only had one quiz, so that's just copied from your quiz. And the third number is your test average. We've only had one test, so that's also copied. Um, and I want to say that uh, some of you did better on this exam than on the first quiz. And my policy is to replace your quiz with your exam score if that helps you. So for some of you, you have the same number in both places. That's because I replaced your uh, quiz score with this exam score, so that's good. If you are not happy with the score that you guys got on this exam, I will tell you that exam two can replace exam one if you do better on exam two than exam one. So this exam one score can completely disappear. That's the good news. The bad news is exam two is harder than exam one. So you're going to have to work, really, really work to get a higher score on that second exam than on this first exam. All right. So all hope is not lost, but the bar is going to be raised for exam two. Uh, Geneva, here we are. Randy, Tyler, yes, Megan. So uh, just see me when I'm checking homework today, and I'll show you what I have missing. And I, I, I write down a lot of numbers in terms of homework grades, and I know I'm not perfect. So if I've got a mistake, we'll fix it. It's easy. But just show me when I'm, when I'm right next to you, okay? All right. Um, okay, so uh, other announcements before we dive in. Um, okay, in terms of homework, I know that things got a little bit messed up because we had a snow day. Uh, what am I doing here? Uh, we had a snow day, and then we had um, a test, and so there were some days when there was more than one thing that was due. So some people never showed me, like, the tail end of the last homework assignment, and I suspect that some people didn't realize that there was homework due today, section 1.9. So I'm just going to um, say that uh, we're back on schedule now, and on schedule means that on Tuesday coming up, our next class, I'm going to be checking 1.10b which probably means some other assignments for most people in this room, okay? So in terms of getting caught up, if you have your green sheet uh, handy, everything up to 1.10b is due on Tuesday. I'll check some homework today because I haven't checked very many people yet, but up to 1.10b and then we should all be caught up in terms of homework. Last announcement, 
Thanks for bearing with me. Um, I think that there's been a, a change to the GCC email protocol in terms of what your username is. So it goes through Gmail and uh, Google made a switch without really giving GCC time to understand and, and inform um, the population about the switch. And we're hoping to get the switch undone. But I think for as of right now, if your old username was Smith J, it's your last name and then first initial and then four digits of your um, student ID number, that used to be the username where you log in. Has anybody logged in in the last, like, say, 48 hours? Yeah, I logged in with, with the short version? Okay, so maybe... Yeah, so I'm not sure. I, I know that it used to be just the short version, but I got an email yesterday saying that it now needs to include the at stuemail.gcc.mass.edu. Now, don't quote me on this, but if you try logging in the usual way and it doesn't work, stick this, this extension on at the end. Like I said, we're hoping to get this undone, and maybe it's already been undone, but I just want to let people know so that you can log into your email without any issues. Okay, so let's jump in here. Um, we are in, uh, we are finally on page 113 of Blue 2. Uh, now, officially, we are done with Blue 1, so you can stop, you can stop bringing Blue 1 with you. We're now in Blue 2 for the next few weeks. You can leave Blue 1 at home. I wouldn't throw it away because you might want to use it to study as we get um, towards that final exam back in May, but you don't need to bring, bring Blue 1 anymore. Okay, so we are going to use these things called algebra blocks to develop the idea of like terms. So um, uh, these are the things inside of the little bins that are on each table. And I figure why should the kids get all the fun and play with the toys? Adults can play with toys too. So what I'd like each of you adults to do is grab one yellow rod and one green cube. One of each. Okay, everybody has two? Okay, so let's, let's talk about these guys. Okay, so we've got a green cube and a yellow rod. Now, you may recall that the volume of a shoebox, each of these is a kind of shoebox, it's just the length times the width times the height, yes? Okay, so the green cube, we're going to say that the, each edge of the green cube has a length of one. I think they're actually each one centimeter, but it's, we'll just call it one anything. And so all three dimensions of this cube are one and one and one. Now I'm just showing you an overhead view. There's a third dimension going into the board that I have not drawn here. But how would you find the volume of this green cube? One times one times one, yes? So what is the volume of that green cube? One. So. Anytime we're trying to represent the number one, we're thinking this green cube, its volume is one. Now the yellow rod is a little bit different. So two of the dimensions, you can, you can actually line up your green cube and your yellow rod right next to each other, which means that two of the dimensions of this yellow rod, the two that you are looking at as I hold this facing you guys, what are the dimensions of that square you're looking at? One and one, because it matches this guy perfectly, right? So it's a one and a one. And then this other guy, okay, it's some number, maybe it's like a three. But what we're going to do is pretend it's a variable, and we're going to call this guy x. And so that's what I've drawn up here in black, is that the, the long side of this yellow rod is an x. It's a variable. So the three dimensions of this yellow rod are 1 and 1 and x. And we multiply them all together to get the volume is 1x. So... The green cube represents what volume? One. The yellow rod represents one vol what volume? X. So we have one and we have X's and that's all we have right now, okay? So here's what I'd like you guys to do. <clears throat> you have a bunch of different uh, yellow rods and green cubes in the, um, in the bin. Now you're just gonna do this as a table so you don't each need to do this individually. But I would like you to form and save the following. Uh, I would like you to form and save um, something that represents 3x plus 4. So grab some stuff out of the bin and all together I need you to make something that represents 3x plus 4. Okay. 
Okay, do we have 3x plus 4? There is good, and there, several, good. 3x plus 4, wonderful, where is it? 3x plus 4, over here, that's beautiful. And what do we have? Lots of designs, but 3x plus 4, wonderful. Okay, so keep that in a group, set it off to the side, don't disturb that set. And then separately, I would like you to form and save. Uh, let's do something like um, 5x plus uh, 2. 5x plus 2, completely separate. Five x plus two. Everybody's got it. So we have two separate piles, right? Two separate collections. Yes. Okay. Now, um, what you're going to do uh, is uh, is nominate some person at the table who has touched these blocks less than anybody else. Everybody has a person that has not touched the blocks yet. Yes. What you're going to do is you're going to shove all of these blocks in front of the person in a messy pile. So don't even try to keep them organized. And that person is going to regroup them. And then you guys are going to tell me what's represented there. So that person, so, so regroup them in the natural way. All, all of them together now in one pile. So you're grouping all the yellow rods and separately grouping all the green cubes. Put them all together. So how many yellow rods, or I guess I'll say this. Uh, what do we have expressed in uh, all together? Eight. X plus six, agree? Yes. You have eight yellow rods and you have six green cubes. Okay, I am going to put a symbol right in here and a symbol right in here to make something that is true. And the symbols that we're going to put are plus and equals. Yes? So this right here is an example of what we call adding like terms. And nobody had any sense that uh, a yellow rod could add to a green cube and make anything meaningful, right? They're completely separate. So in terms of adding 3x and 4 to this 5x and 2, there's no way to take that 4 and somehow mush it into that 5x, right? They just have nothing in common. They don't make 9 anything. They don't make 20 anything. There's nothing to do with each other, right? Which ones go together? Right, so then we said the 3x and the 5x go together, and that's how we got the 8x, by just adding them up. And then completely separately, uh, we said that the, um, the 4 and the 2 went together, and that, that was our 6 green cubes, okay? All right, so what I, are we okay? Is that there? All right, so we're going to do together this number 9 here real quick. And I will say that equation is more complicated than any one that we've solved before. We're not going to build it, but we're going to use this idea of like terms from up above. Maybe I should write down here, say that uh, this and this are called like terms. And then separately, this one and this one were also like terms. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I got distracted. The blue too? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do this one together. Some of you might have already started. So what we're going to do first is highlight the ones that go together. So I'm going to put a big line right here down on the equal sign, and we're not going to cross over for a little while. So I'm going to highlight anything that's, uh, that goes together on the left-hand side. Which ones go together? 7x, 24x. I don't want to just call that 8x, although you can think of it that. I'm going to also highlight the minus sign, right? Make sure you're, you're subtracting the 8x as opposed to adding the 8x. So all together, 7x and 24x is 31 what? X. X. And just make sure, it's not the same, is it? I'll get you a, uh, 
it's going to be it's going to be similar. It's going to be really similar. Um, but I can't. I, I, there's too much going on right now. Okay. Can I highlight one thing? Everybody right now in this room is quite comfortable saying 7x plus 24x is 31x, right? But it's going to be really tempting at some point to lose sight of the fact that we're just adding yellow rods and getting yellow rods and say, oh, there's an x and there's another x, so that's an x squared. And it's not, and it never will be. All you're doing is taking some yellows and you're adding more yellows and you just get yellows. Seven apples plus 24 apples. Okay. <laughs> So uh, that's good. So that was 31x, and then we subtract the 8x, and we get, what is that, 23? 23x. And then separately in green, we've got 6 and the minus 4. I know it doesn't quite match up. I'll, I'll get you a current one, but... No, it's all right. I yes. Yes. Yeah, so the 7x plus the 24x, everyone is quite happy to say that that's 31x right now because all we're doing is adding some seven yellow rods and another 24 yellow rods. But we don't put the two on top. And you don't put the two. Like it's tempting, but the yellow rods are just x, and so it's not x squared. It's just straight old x. Yeah, so when you add these guys, you just copy the x because that's the yellow rod. Okay, and then the green things add up together. These are our green cubes, so 6 minus 4 is uh, 2, so that's a plus 2. And then I'm going to put my equal sign there. And then on the right-hand side, which ones are my yellow rods? The 10x and the minus 3x, so all together that gives me 7x. And then which ones are my green cubes? It's plus 5 and plus 4, plus 9. Okay, and now it looks a lot better. And now we, I think we know that we got to move the x's over to the same side, right? Now you have a choice here. You can either subtract the 23x or you can subtract the 7x. Now both is legitimate, but there's a way to do it and avoid negative numbers. Which way should we move? We should move that 7x over. Why? Yeah, it's going to still be positive because there's more X's on the left. So that's my rule of thumb. I, I, we as a species are just not as good at dealing with negative numbers as we are with positive numbers. So make a good choice, that is, move things to where there are more. So let's move the 7X over to the left. So subtract 7X from both sides. And uh, what do we get there? Uh, 16x plus 2 equals 9. Uh, we subtract because it's a, it's a positive right now. We just do whatever is the opposite of what's there. Okay, and then we got to move the 2 by doing what? Subtract 2 from both sides. Get rid of some of this stuff here. Uh, okay, so what do we have now? 16x equals 7, and then finally, solving for x, divide by 16. The number touching the x is the one that needs to move. So we get x equals 7 over 16. Some people are disturbed when we have a fraction as an answer and you think you did it wrong. It's not. Just leave it. Just leave it. Yeah. I know that some people really like decimals over fractions, but decimals are often approximations. So we just leave this as 7 sixteenths. That is the final answer. The only other obligation you would have here is if it reduced. Like if it was 8 sixteenths, as Marcy said, you would have to reduce that to one half. But other than that, fractions are generally preferred to decimals. Okay, last thing I want to say about this example is that when we, um, when we subtracted 7x from both sides, do you see how there was a, a subtract 7x on the left of the equal sign, and then there was a subtract 7x on the right of the equal sign? That's the way it has to be. So I'm just going to circle these two and just say notice that one on each side of 
the equal sign. And I point that out because there's a temptation for some people to do something that's illegal. This is just the original problem, the left-hand side copied down. There's a temptation for some people to do the following, to say, um, okay, look, I have a 7x here, and so I want to move that. So I'll say subtract 7x, and I'll say subtract 7x, and then they'll subtract. And uh, this 7x would go away, I guess, and then the 24x minus 7x is whatever it is, 17x. And it's just not right. It's not allowed. You're not allowed to subtract 7x from one term and then from another term, both on the same side. But it's tempting to do because in some sense it's cleaner. You've gotten rid of the 7x. You've compressed some x terms down. But you've got to be really clear that when you're doing something uh, to both sides of the equal sign that really you put them on the separate sides. So the first step is to group all the terms and then it gets much nicer and then you start moving terms. Questions on this one? Uh, you can move to whichever side you want. I prefer to move things to keep stuff positive. I moved it to the left because there were 23 x's here, which was bigger than the 7 x's over there. Yeah. We still would have gotten the same answer. It would have looked something like this. If we had, if we had swapped sides, then we would have ended up with a negative 7 equals negative 16 x compared to this guy. And then we would divide both sides by what? Negative 16. Negative 16, negative 16. And the answer here, it looks like negative 7 over negative 16, but you'll lose a point if you leave it that way. Got to turn it into a positive. That's one of our rules. When you divide two negative numbers, it becomes positive, and it turns exactly into that. OK. All right, on the next page. There are some notes, and I would like you to jump down here to number 10 and try that with your neighbors. Okay, so I know we were all in different places on that previous section. Um, I think it's a really important section, so all those problems that you didn't have a chance to get to, I would encourage you to spend time over the weekend working on those. It's a really important skill. It's not one of these uh, techniques where you use it one day and then never again until the test. We're going to be using that skill throughout. So go through and fill in those blanks if you didn't have a chance to do enough problems to feel confident with that technique. Okay, so here we are on page 119. Um, we've got, uh, what do we have? We have an objective. I'm talking way too much. Jessica, can you read the objective, please? Okay, so two things happening in this class. One of them is negative exponents. It's a fairly easy skill, but it's something that's probably new to many of you. The other one is stuff that we've done before. We've spent plenty of time defining problems, circling quantities and underlining units, and we've spent time solving multi-step equations, but we haven't done the two of them together yet. So that's why it looks like it's all old stuff, but they haven't been paired up in this way before in our class. So the only thing we're gonna spend time on together right now is this negative exponents. Here's number one. Here's how we handle negative exponents. We're going to use a little story to figure out exactly what's going on with these things here. So first, I'm going to do something kind of strange. I'm just going to write the answers. So I will say that this is 1 over 6 squared. And you can copy that. That's the answer. Now I'm going to change it. What is 6 squared? is 36. So, so really the final answer is 1 over 36, but the question you should have right now is, well, how did we write down that first thing? So we'll, we'll get there. Uh, it turns out this guy right here is 4 to the 3, 4 to the 3, just plain old 4 to the 3. And then 4 times 4 times 4 is 64, but you should have a question there. Why is that the case? And then this one here, it turns out is 5 over 2, squared plus two-fifths somehow it becomes five over two and now it's to the positive two instead of negative two and now I'm going to write this guy 
uh, the way I encourage you to write it. If you see something squared, I think writing it twice is the smartest way to go. And then how do we multiply fractions? Straight across. So upstairs is 25 over 4. <coughs> And reduce if you can, but leave it like that. There's nothing to reduce, and I wouldn't go to a mixed number. Yeah, just leave it improper. Okay, so the second equal sign in each one shouldn't be a question. It's really the first equal sign that you should be asking about right now. So here's the story, and this is something that one of, um, so Sandy is my colleague here, and, and essentially she created all of these wonderful packets that we use, um, and one of her former students created this story that Sandy really liked, and I like it too. So here's the idea. You see a negative exponent. We're going to think of that negative exponent as being a baby, and sometimes babies need attention, right? Sometimes when you're holding them up, they want you to put them down. And sometimes when they're down, they want you to pick them up, right? And so they're very negative some of the times when they aren't getting what they want. And so that negative exponent you're going to think about is a negative crying baby. And that negative crying baby doesn't like the position that you've got them in. So I'm going to put a little fraction here just to make it clear which where this baby is. What's on the bottom here? There's a one. So I'm going to say that that baby is right now upstairs, right? Up in your arms. You're holding that baby. And that baby is negative. So where does the baby want to be instead of in your arms? It wants to be down on the floor. And so we put the baby down on the floor. And the baby used to be negative, but now the baby's positive too. You see the positive? It's silly, but it's memorable. What's that? It is a reciprocal. That's what negative exponents means, is a reciprocal. But we're going to think about babies instead. OK, so it's important. We did two things simultaneously there. We put the baby on the floor, and that made the baby positive. Both things happen at the same time. Okay, in part B, where's the baby? Baby's on the bottom, on the floor. But the baby is negative. Baby doesn't want to be on the floor. Baby wants to be picked up. So we pick the baby up. Now I'll put the invisible fraction. What is down here? One. So now clearly the baby is up in your arms. And what changed? The baby became positive. It got what it wanted. Okay. Now in the two-fifths case, two kids. We got twins. Where's the two? The two is on top, meaning... On the floor or in your arms? Two is in your arms. Where's the five? On the floor. But they are both in the parentheses, which means that that negative exponent applies to both babies. They're both unhappy with their current state. Yes? So the two, which is upstairs, really wants to go downstairs on the floor. And the five, which is on the floor, would really, whoops, where'd it go? The five would really like to be picked up. And so you pick up the five and you put the two down, and that negative exponent became positive. Both babies are happy right now, okay? So you see a negative exponent, you move it to where it's not. If it's upstairs, move it down. If it's downstairs, move it up. So I'm just going to write up here a little thing without the babies. Negative exponents mean movement. If you see a negative exponent, you must move that thing. Move it to where it's not, up or down. And then it becomes a positive exponent. OK. I think that's the last thing I'm going to say uh, to the entire group today, which gives us, when do we end? 45? Okay, so that gives us about 25 minutes, which is a good amount of time. You're first going to do some stuff with this negative exponents rule. So take your time. Work very carefully with your neighbors. I will put the answers up, but I want to wait a few minutes before you guys have a chance to discuss before I flash up the answers. And then continue on to the next pages, which have lots of word problems. I'll walk around and help and check homework as well.